subject like this, I need to be able to show you, I need to be able to illustrate to you what we're talking about, and it, it shouldn't be much of a, it, it's really a no-brainer, to be honest with you, as to why we're talking about this subject. We all know what is going on at Wheaton right now. We know that there is a tremendous discussion going on in our society. Do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Well, we had actually decided to do this topic uh, before all of that exploded. As most of you know, uh, starting in about 2006, I began dealing much more extensively with the subject of Islam with my first major debate against Shabir Ali. Some of you keep asking me, when is your book going to be done with Shabir Ali? We know we're very late. We just had a discussion about it this past weekend, and uh, we have uh, recommitted ourselves. And in some ways, I'm sort of glad we've been delayed because now we can add in uh, some of the discussion that needs to be had concerning uh, what is Islam? Is there such thing as a one true kind of Islam? Or is, uh, is there a, a number of expressions of Islam? We'll be able to be addressing some of those things. But <clears throat> we know that right now you're probably being asked, if you're in ministry, if you're a Christian, well, what do you think? Do you, do you think Christians and Muslims worship the same God? And there are many people within what's called the broader Christian community that are saying, well, well of course. There is a book that came out a number of years ago from an Ivy League school scholar who uh, argues that, well, well obviously, uh, we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and the Muslims believe in the God who revealed himself to Abraham, not so much the Isaac and Jacob part, but uh, certainly to Abraham and to, uh, to Ishmael. Uh, and uh, so historically, there's this, this connection. And that is the direct claim uh, of the Quran itself. In Surah 29, I will be giving you both the uh, the, the surahs of the Quran, and I, let me just ask very quickly, how many of you here have read all of the Quran? There was something funny about that? <laughs> <laughs> all right, how many of you realize that unless you read it in Arabic, from the Arabic perspective, you've, from the Muslim perspective, you did not read the Quran either? Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, very small percentage, and unfortunately, if I were to ask a uh, Muslim group of this size, the same question, you'd have about the same percentage of people who have actually read the Christian scriptures. Just the Christian scriptures, not even the whole Bible. And so our two communities normally are, are passing by as ships in the night. Uh, even when we talk, very often we're using different vocabularies. Very rarely do we have meaningful communication with one another. But you and I are addressed in the text of the Quran. And given that we're talking about a billion and a half people in the world, it would seem to me that it might be wise if we know what the Quran says to us. Now, the Quran's a small book. It's only 56% the length of the New Testament, only 14% the length of the Bible. So it doesn't take all that long to get through. However, just a, a, a warning as we go past this, if you do decide to write, to, to, to write the Quran, don't bother, it's already been written. Uh, if you decide to <laughs> read the Quran, do not bother attempting to understand it by reading from Sir, from, from the beginning, Surah Al-Fatiha, the seven-verse opening prayer, through Surah Al-Baqarah, the, lar the longest uh, surah with hundreds of verses in it, all the way through to Surah 114. You won't be able to make heads or tails out of it because it's not arranged chronologically. You'll be jumping back and forth between bis different periods in the author's life. If you're going to actually read it, you need to get hold of a, a, a well, the, there's a new publication just out called The Study Quran. It's actually very good. Uh, it's a, it's a, I'll be using that translation this morning, in fact. Um, it gives you some introductions. And I wrote a book called What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. I included somewhere around page 52 or so a chart of the chapters of the Quran and the order in which they were probably written. So if you read it in that way, at least you're going chronologically. You can follow themes, development of themes, and things like that. Now, the Muslims are not overly concerned about doing that because from the orthodox Sunni perspective, the Quran reflects nothing of Muhammad's understanding in the first place. You need to understand, their understanding of, of Revelation is that the Quran was sent down, the Quran is uncreated, it's as eternal as Allah is. And it was sent down in one night, Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power during the month of Ramadan, to Jibril, the angel, and then over 22 years he parceled it out to Muhammad, who then memorized it and narrated it to his people, who then memorized it, and that's how it came to be. And so Muhammad has nothing to do with the Quran from their perspective. You can't ask about what he understood about the Trinity. You can't ask anything like that because it's irrelevant. Nothing in the Quran represents Muhammad's understanding in the first place. Now, obviously, as, we can, as you can understand, that fundamentally changes the nature of the study of the Quran on the part of Muslims. 
they're not overly concerned. When you and I preach from Corinthians, we want to know about Paul's background. We want to know about the Corinthians' background. We want to know what was going on in the Roman world that, in, that, in that, that time period. None of that's relevant to the exegesis of the Quran because it's eternally existed in the heavenly tablet. So it, it changes how it's understood, and it changes how Muslims deal with the text of the Quran itself. So uh, the Quran is organized by the longest surah is number two, then it gets a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter. That's how it's put together. Um, no one knows why it was done that way. That's just simply the way that it is. And that's why after 9-11, when all the CNN reporters were running around into Barnes & Noble, buying Qurans to try to find something to put into their reports, they were left standing there holding a Quran with no idea what to do with it because it did not many, make any sense to them whatsoever. Can't get into much more of that right now, but it is a fascinating background. But in Surah 29, the Surah of the Spider, we read these words, and dispute not with the Alal Kitab, the people of the book. Now, the people of the book can be Jews, the people of the book can be Christians, and sometimes it's both Jews and Christians, and sometimes we can't really tell. We are directly addressed as the Alal Anjil twice in the Quran, which means the people of the gospel. That's pretty specific, but very often the Alal Kitab, the people of the book, are Christians, and that is defined by the context when we read it. Dispute not with the people of the book, save in the most virtuous manner, unless it be those of them who have done wrong. And say, we believe in that which was sent down unto us, and was sent down unto you. Our God and your God are one, and unto him are we submitters." Thus have we sent down unto thee the book, which would be the Quran. So those unto whom we have given the book believe in it. Among them are some who believe in it, and none reject our signs save the disbelievers. Now, it, again, it's, it's difficult at times to follow the context. It, it seems to me that the last verse is saying that if you reject the Quran, then you are a kafir, you're an unbeliever, and that is how most Muslims would view us as unbelievers. But we are directly addressed, and notice what is said we believe in that which was sent down unto us and was sent down to you. The Muslims believe that the Torah and the Injil were sent down to us, that they are revelations from God. They are Natsal. They're sent down. They contain light and guidance. They are divine revelations when they were originally given. Now, whether we still possess those things, that's where the differences arise. Um, and most Muslims today would say we no longer possess those things. There is now a mixture, a corruption that has taken place. But here's the key phrase, our God and your God are one, and unto him are we submitters. So there is, there is the Muslim answer to the question, do we worship the same God? But that would be somewhat simplistic to just stop right there, because there are many Muslims that recognize, and that's one of the things I like about the New Study Quran, it recognizes this as well. There are Muslims who recognize the definitional nature of the Trinity in Christian thought. And so a serious Muslim will say, well, we are making reference to the same historical God. But the Quran itself says, as we will see, that we have gone into excess. We have gone beyond what Allah has spoken. We have gone astray, specifically in the exaltation of Jesus to the position of deity. And so I think a more serious Thought, thoughtful Muslim will recognize, well, we may be making historical reference to the same God, but when it comes to the God we worship, there is a fundamental difference between the Unitarian monotheism of Islam and the Trinitarian monotheism of the Christian faith. Now, very briefly, I want to emphasize why it is vitally important for us to have a solid background in our own Trinitarian theology before we attempt to engage with the Muslim. Sadly, in many of the places I go to, for example, the past few years I have been debating in South Africa. We're going to be trying to get back there in, uh, in May of this year. And I simply have to keep in mind the fact that almost every single Muslim with whom I'm speaking has never spoken with a functionally literate Trinitarian Christian. The church in South Africa is in pretty sad shape. There are some good churches there, but they're few and far between. And as a result, many of these so-called Christian churches are barely monotheistic, let alone truly Trinitarian. And so very often I am talking with a Muslim and they show tremendous confusion as to what I'm saying because they've never spoken to someone like me before. 
They've never spoken to someone who is self-consciously Trinitarian and who understands why they're Trinitarian and can explain what the doctrine of the Trinity is. I have to keep that in mind. And one of the most important insights, and I, I'm going to be uh, very open here, I was so thankful as a young person to encounter the writings of B.B. Warfield on the subject of the Trinity. Uh, his insights, I think, were just absolutely fantastic. I have been deeply influenced by them. And one of those insights, and I will be expanding upon this uh, tomorrow morning, in fact, is what I have here. The Trinity is primarily revealed between the Testaments. Its revelation takes place in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In other words, there is a revelation in history. God has revealed himself in the coming of the Son, the fact that the Son differentiates himself from the Father, differentiates himself from the Son, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. They use personal pronouns of one another, everything that you were just listening to from Dr. Ware. There, but this took place in history. We're, we're, we don't, we're not saying this is mythology. That is why we know who was king and who was Caesar and what the geographical locations were. This took place in history. The incarnation took place in history. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place in history so that Peter is an experiential Trinitarian. He had walked with the Son. He heard the Father speaking in the Mount of Transfiguration. He's now indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. This has been his experience. It took place in history itself. And so the New Testament then becomes the record of that historical revelation, not primarily the locus of that revelation. In other words, the New Testament is not trying to argue some new doctrine of God. It is written in light of what that one God of the Old Testament has done in sending his son and in, in pouring out his spirit upon his people. And so that's why we have the kind of, of references that we have in the New Testament. To quote from Warfield, it is clear, in other words, that as we read the New Testament, we are not witnessing the birth of a new conception of God. What we meet within its pages is a firmly established conception of God underlying and giving its tone to the whole fabric. It is not in a text here and there that the New Testament bears its testimony to the doctrine of the Trinity. The whole book is Trinitarian to the core. All its teaching is built on the assumption of the Trinity, and its allusions to the Trinity are frequent, cursory, easy, and confident. It is with a view to the cursoriness of the allusions to it in the New Testament that it has been remarked that the doctrine of the Trinity is not so much heard as overheard in the statements of Scripture. It would be more exact to say that it is not so much inculcated as presupposed. The doctrine of the Trinity does not appear in the New Testament in the making, but as already made. I think this is extremely important to understand. It explains why Paul, you just heard Dr. Ware talking briefly about about his expansion of the Shema in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and, and why it, it, he's not embarrassed to be able to take the very words that were used in the Greek Septuagint to translate Deuteronomy 6.4, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, into the Greek language and then he expands them in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and says, but to us there is but one God, the Father, for whom are all things and we for him, and one Kurios, one Lord, the very word that was used of Yahweh, through whom are all things, and we through him. There's, he's not going, now let me explain this to you. I know you've never heard this before. No. It is, it, is, it is the presupposition of the experience of the primitive church, and that explains so much of why the New Testament addresses the subject in the way that it does. But here's the problem. Now we're dealing, when we talk about Islam, when you're talking to a Muslim, you're talking to a person who has, as his ultimate authority, a book that is only 14% the length of the Bible. And it was written by an individual who did not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Did not have direct access to the written scriptures. In fact, the earliest manuscripts we can find in Arabic of both the Old and New Testament come from almost 200 years after the time of Muhammad. There may have been individual texts that have been translated by individual Arabic Christians, but the idea of having access to the text as a whole, he didn't have access to that. And it's very obvious that what he did know were oral stories. He had heard people talking about stories in the Old Testament and talking about stories in the New Testament. And that's what ends up in many of the pages of the, of the Quran are these oral stories that are changed in, in the very ways you'd expect given the fact that the writer is dependent upon oral transmission and does not have a direct solid source of information to draw from. So what does the Quran say to 
us. Well, oh, wait a second. Sorry about that. Before I, before I go there, the result of the confusion of the author of the Quran is confusion on the part of Muslims themselves. I have two little brief clips to play for you to give you an, an idea of some of the attitudes. Now, these are not the best attitudes, but they are the most prevalent. In other words, I could play you clips from scholarly Muslims who take the time to read and understand and we can have engagement on that level, but that's not the street level Islam that you're going to encounter, for example, if you get in a cab and try to get to the airport. Uh, and you end up having a conversation with a cabbie who uh, has been here only three or four years from Lebanon or Syria or someplace like that, and you have a conversation. And by the way, most of the time, they want to talk to you about your faith. I mean, you try to get a secularist to talk about your faith, like pulling teeth. But, uh, but I, my experience has been, you've got the cabbie, and you know, he'll, he'll take the long way around just to talk to you about theology. He might have another reason for doing that, but I wouldn't even suggest that. <laughs> so the attitudes that you're going to get are going to be very different. Let me give you, and let's, let's hope this works. Uh, if not, I'm going to have to skip over it. But let me give you some two examples. The first is from my first Muslim debate that wasn't a Muslim debate. This was a debate that I did in 1999. I had not yet started studying Islam, but I was debating a Muslim simply on the doctrine of the Trinity. This was one of the audience questions. Listen to what the questioner has to say. And by the way, right at the beginning, if you look down toward the bottom, you'll see a very pretty lady. That's my wife looking back. And then a little girl looking back. That was my daughter, Summer. She was all of nine years old. Uh, she now has two children. So this was a while ago. Uh, and uh, here, let's, let's see how this is going to work. Oh, here we go. Yes, my question to the doctor. I heard you repeating many times, you saying he's a creator about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Be some blessing be upon him, because we Muslims believe in Jesus, the mighty prophet of God. I heard you many times, you saying he's the creator of everything and all things. So I want you to explain to me if it's possible, if he's a creator of everything, when Jesus, be some blessing be upon him, was he walking by the fig tree with his companion, the fig tree with his companion, and he wants to eat some fig, and they told him, Master, the fig is not in season. So if he was God, how he don't know if he create the tree, how he know how he does he doesn't know if what's in season or what not in season if he create everything okay. okay and if the fig was not in season and he's god first of all we don't accept god to be hungry he wants to eat but you christian you said god choose to do so so that's your faith but i'm saying even if you was god and fig is not in season why he couldn't order the tree to bring fig Okay, Isn't that you. God the one create everything? Now, let me just stop it right there. Okay, thank I love watching audiences when I play this. Because a lot of you are going, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses who came to my door last week were better than that. I mean, uh, they've, got, you know, they've got pretty strong arguments. First of all, he is repeating a Quranic argument. This is an argument from the, from the Quran. We'll see it later on. But... You've never heard someone use the fig tree argument before, have you? <laughs> Jesus can't be God because he didn't know when figs were in season. And if he was God, he could have just sold the tree, bring forth figs, and there will be frigs, figs and you can eat the figs, right? And you go, that's silly. But please understand something. That's not an answer. That's not an answer. That doesn't help him. And unfortunately, sometimes these objections are so outside of our range of experience that we're just left going, oh, come on, man, really? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and you've got to realize he probably, he doesn't look like he comes from around here. He wasn't born in Iowa. <laughs> so the, the country that he came from, he has probably never met a Christian who could even begin to give him a meaningful understanding of what the fig tree was about, how the fig tree represented Israel, how this was at the beginning of that final week, and, and the, the, the tree had leaves on it but didn't have fruit, just like the people of Israel looked like they had fruit, but they didn't really have fruit. Um, he hasn't heard that before. He hasn't read Mark. He hasn't read the parallel accounts. He doesn't know. 
What he needs is the Christian who knows those things well enough to explain them to him. But this is a Quranic argument. The Quran will make this argument. And that's the level of it. Let's take a look at another example. And this is a debate in 2008 with Sheikh Jalal Abu Alrub. He's a little bit hard to understand. He's Palestinian. But what you can get fairly clearly is he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Let's listen to what he had to say. The last hour. This is only the father. You remember my opponent? He said that Christians don't consider Jesus the father. Well, then he doesn't know about the last hour because he's not divine. Oh, but he is in complete harmony with the father. Really? One of them died and the Holy Ghost and God had no idea what's going on. One of them died. No, the one who died is an addition, not a subtraction. Come on, people. Offer the creed the same way Abraham gave it to his people. Did he ever say anything like this? We're angry here. I was insulted twice here. The terrible stuff my opponent said about Muhammad, وسلم, taking stuff out of context and put, you know, using fabricated words. And secondly, calling a son to God is the greatest offense, offense to us Muslims. So don't think that you can come here and act you're angry because we are angry because Allah doesn't have a son. He told you so. Jesus never said, I am Lord, I'm divine. I'm the, I'm the God, the creator. Worship me as you worship God. The Holy Ghost is God. Adam didn't say it. Abraham didn't say it. Noah didn't say it. They must have known another God than you one, the one you know. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open your hearts and minds. Because Jesus said it in so many ways that he's not God. You just want well, to stick go. it to him no matter what. Now, he said he was angry because he had been insulted twice today. Uh, the terrible things his opponent said about Muhammad. He had done a debate earlier in the day with David Wood on whether Muhammad was a prophet. But then notice what the second reason, why was he so angry? Because I was ascribing a son to Allah. And the Quran says that is one of the most terrible things you can ever do is ascribe a son to Allah. Now, what the author of the Quran understood that to mean is what we need to take a look at. But from his perspective, that why, that's why he was most angry, is that we were ascribing a son to Allah, and that is to violate the central affirmation of Islamic theology, which is known as Tawheed. Tawheed means the oneness of Allah. But what that has come to, be under, to, to mean is the Unitarian oneness of a law and so the one sin the worst sin that can be committed is to violate that which is the sin of shirk shirk is the association of anyone or anything with a law and the vast majority of muslims in the world believe that you and i are mushrik we're mushrikun we commit shirk because of our worship of jesus now there are muslims that recognize that we're monotheists and they will not use that terminology but the vast majority of Muslims in the world do think that when the Quran's talking about those who associate with Allah, that our worship of Jesus falls into that. And I think you can make a fairly strong case for that from the text of the Quran itself. So let's take a look at the Quranic witness. The Quran never uses the technical term in popular use by Arabic speaking Christians in the seventh century for the Trinity. It's just not there. Instead, the Quran refers to thalaf. The, the ordinal number, one, two, three, word three, when, when seeking clearly to speak of the Trinity, and in those contexts, that's going to become very important for us. Let's look at some of the texts. Here in Surah 18, we read, Praise be to God who sent down the book unto his servant and placed no crookedness therein, upright that he may warn a great uh, might of a great might coming from his presence and give glad tidings unto the believers who perform righteous deeds that theirs shall be a beautiful reward wherein they shall remain forever and that he may warn those who say God has taken a child. They have no knowledge thereof nor do their fathers. A monstrous word it is that in issues from their mouths they speak not but a lie. So who are these people who say God has taken a child? Well remember uh, Muhammad spoke very much against the polytheism in Mecca. The Kaaba was said to have had 360 idols in it. Uh, Muhammad spoke against that for the first years of his prophethood. He was a minority prophet. He was abused and mistreated there in the city of Mecca. Uh, only through the intercession of his uncle Abu Talib was he not even killed. And so some would say, in this context, we're only talking about the pagan deities of Arabia, 
not necessarily talking about Christianity. Unfortunately, very, very few of the Muslims with whom you will have dialogue seek to study the Quran the way we study the Bible and hence make uh, important distinctions between such things as this. In Surah Maryam, Surah, the, the Surah of Mary, the only woman named in the Quran, by the way, Jesus' mother, uh, Surah Maryam 88, and, say the, and they say the compassionate has taken a child. You have indeed asserted a terrible thing. The heavens are well nigh rent thereby, and the earth split asunder, and the mountains made to fall down in ruins, that they should claim for the compassionate a child. It is not fitting for the compassionate to take a child. There is none in the heavens and on the earth, but that it comes under the compassionate as a servant. And so here, this is really the background of what Sheikh Jalal Abu Arub was saying, is it's a terrible thing. It's that the mountains fall down when you ascribe a son unto God. There is the very language of the Quran itself. In Surah 39, uh, verses, ayat, ayat 3 and 4, the verses are called ayahs, ayat in, uh, in the Quran. Behold, unto God belongs the pure religion, and those who take protectors apart from him say, We do not worship them, save to bring us nigh and nearness unto God. Truly God will judge between them regarding that wherein they differ. Truly God does not guide one who is a disbelieving liar. Had God wanted to take a child, he would have chosen whatsoever he willed from that which he created. Glory be to him, he is the one, the paramount. So if God wanted to have a child, he could have. He could have, could have derived one from the created order, but the Quran is saying he never did anything like that. And even those people who say, well, you know, we're just worshiping these idols to bring us closer to God, this particular text denies that that is a possibility at all. In Surah 6101, they make the jinn, I'm sorry, 6100, they make the jinn partners unto God, jinn, as in genie. You, the, the, the Muslims believe that there are these, things, these creatures called jinn. Um, they are, smart, they are, they are uh, faster than us, they're stronger than us, but they're not as smart as we are, which sounds to me like a teenager with a Camaro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> potent, dangerous combination there. Um, but what's interesting enough is they believe, many of them believe, that there are Muslim jinn, Christian jinn, Jewish jinn. I'm not sure how you could have an atheist jinn, but uh, I, I don't know. But that's where it comes from. They make the jinn partners, that shirk, partners unto God, though he created them and falsely attribute sons and daughters to him without any knowledge. Glory be to him, exalt is he above that which they ascribe. The unique originator of the heavens and the earth how should he have a child when he has no consort? And he created all things, and he is knower of all, of all things. When, when I was studying with an Arabic tutor, I asked him, what is this, this word consort? What, is, what does that mean? He said, well, to be perfectly honest with you, in modern Arabic, it's the woman on the side. Um, it's not the normal standard term for a wife. It's sort of the, the, the woman you don't want anybody to know about is the term that is used here. And that would seem to have some type of sexual overtones of begetting a child, which is exactly what the situation was in Arabia in that day. There were gods who had offspring, daughters, sons, so on and so forth. Now, very importantly, uh, the Quran does not contain much in the way of creedal statements. Uh, if I was giving my full, my full Islam presentation, I would have already shown you someone taking the shahada. This is how you become a, a Muslim. You have to make a profession of faith uh, in the Arabic language. You have to have someone lead you through it, say, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. Uh, and you have to say it in a particular way with witnesses, and that's how you become a Muslim. No, I did not just become a Muslim because I don't believe what I'm saying. So one of the... <laughs> I was there when what became... I saw it happen right there. <laughs> we were at the G3 conference, and there he just went out over the edge, and that was... And tomorrow there will be a blog article somewhere saying exactly that, I can assure you. <laughs> there are actually seven conditions that, that classical Islamic theology is, has prescribed that you have to fulfill for your shahada to be real. Now one thing that's interesting, how many in here made your profession of faith in either biblical Greek or biblical Hebrew? I'm looking for the one uh, seminarian, there's always a seminary, you know, you know the kind? You know, I did, ha 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 ha. You did not. Now, 
the Shahada, its language is actually found in, in the Quran in, in fragmentary allusions. But Muhammad is alleged to have said in the Hadith that to quote this one surah, and this is an entire surah, this is called Surah Ali Klas, the purity, the sincerity. To quote this one surah is to quote a third of the Quran. And so that means, that makes it very, very important. Most Muslims do know this particular section of the Quran. And so we look at, notice it says, say he is, he, God is one. God, the eternal sufficient unto himself. He begets not, nor was he begotten, and none is like unto him. That's the entire, the entire section. And when we look at that, three of the four verses, three of the four ayat, we would agree with. Sounds very much like Isaiah, Jeremiah. There is no God like unto our God. There is, he is the creator of all things. He is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. Everything you see in the trial of false gods, from Isaiah 40 through 48, right there uh, in, in illusion, except for the third ayah, lem yelid wa lem yulid. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. Now, <clears throat> again, street-level Islam sees you and I right there. That's about Christianity. I took one of my seminary classes uh, to the, the mosque in Tempe, Arizona, and we watched the prayers. We talked to the imam afterwards. And I asked him, do you think that the third ayah of Surah Ali Klas, the Yalad Walam Yulad, is specifically about Christianity and Christian belief? He said, oh, there's no question about it, no question about it. There are more westernized Muslim scholars that would go, no, uh, not necessarily at all. Uh, there's, there is disagreement, and there isn't a, a, a pope uh, to say, well, it's this. Of course, the Pope never does that either, but uh, especially the current Pope, but that's a whole other subject. We can't get into that today. But it's right there, and the vast majority of Muslims do believe that this is about you and I. And so it is a major barrier that in one of the most important texts of the Quran, you have the specific denial of this idea, he begets not, nor was he begotten, and they understood that to refer to you and I. Now, this sin of shirk, here's just two verses that mention how important this is. In uh, Surah 31, And behold, Luqman said to his son, admonishing him, O my son, do not ascribe partners unto God. Truly ascribing partners is a tremendous wrong. That's that word shirk, to associate. It is a tremendous wrong. In Surah 6.1, Praise be to God who created the heavens and the earth and made darkness and light. Yet those who do not believe, the kafirs, which very frequently many Muslims will just refer to as just very flippantly as coffers, unbelievers. Uh, those who do not believe ascribe equals to their Lord. In other words, coffers commit shirk. And that's what most of them think you are inviting them to do. And what you need to understand is one of the greatest barriers to presenting the gospel to Muslims. There are three barriers. The greatest one is they believe you are inviting them to commit the one unpardonable sin. There is only one unpardonable sin. The, the Muslim sources say God can forgive anything. He can, he can forgive. Uh, there's a story about, that Muhammad told about a man who had killed 100 people. And God actually made the earth shrink just so that, that one particular person could go to heaven. He forgave a, a mass murderer who was just looking to repent. But if you die as a mushrik, a committer of shirk, there is no forgiveness for you. Muhammad asked of Allah the right to pray for his parents who died as mushrikun, he was denied. His uncle Abu Talib, who protected him while he was a minority prophet, did not embrace Islam before he died. The one exception is that Muhammad was allowed to pray for his uncle Abu Talib. And as a result, Abu Talib has the best spot in hell. I always stop there because everyone looks at me and goes, so exactly what does the best spot in hell look like? <laughs> well, the Hadith are filled with lots of descriptions of hellfire and things like that. And the story is that Abu Talib is wearing sandals that are so hot, his brains boil. That's the garden spot of hell from the Islamic perspective. And that's how serious shirk is. Now, here, let's dig into some of the longer texts here because here's where we start to get uh, addressed. Surah 447, O you unto whom the book was given, that's the Al-Al Kitab, that's us. Believe in what we have sent down, confirming that which is with you. So it sounds like the argument is the Quran confirms 
what we already possess ourselves and what's called the Torah in the Injil, before we blot out faces and turn them backwards or curse them as we curse those who broke the Sabbath. And the command of God shall be fulfilled. Truly God forgives not that any partner be ascribed unto him. There's the specific case in the Quran that says, shirk cannot be forgiven. God does not forgive that any partner be ascribed unto him, but he forgives what is less than that for whomsoever he will. For whosoever ascribes partners unto God has surely fabricated a tremendous sin. I just, just briefly have to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm hurrying as fast as I can, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching that clock back there. Oh, that's not good. Uh, while we, we hopefully get that connected back up, um, I was, maybe I have to see if it's been, been, it's come off on my end. Okay, I'll, I'll hook back up again. I was doing a debate uh, in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, and I saw this striking, beautiful young girl, 13 or 14 years of age, all black robe, all I could see was her face. I could see she desperately wanted to communicate something to me. We weren't taking audience questions. As soon as the debate was over, I, I motioned for her to come over, and she comes over to me, and with tears flowing out of her eyes, she says to me, do not say three. There is no helper for those who say three. Hellfire will be the abode for those who say three. She's quoting directly from the Quran. And she is weeping and telling, she, all she's hearing me say is three. Now what that means, we'll get to here in a second. But I remember the, the, the tremendous fervor that was hers. And I remember being her age and being fervent in my faith. And it just made my heart break that I, as clearly as I tried to speak to her, she just could not hear because this, this told her what I believed. But this isn't accurate about what I believe. And that's where the problem, that's where the problem is. And yet it says, confirming that which is with you. As if what we possess that came down from God is actually uh, revealed scripture. Now, Surah 4171, O people of the book, that's us again, al kitab do not exaggerate in your religion nor utter anything concerning God save the truth. That term exaggerate, to, to aglu, it's a very difficult word to say. I, I, I normally just spit on myself when I try it, but it is a term that refers to going over the bounds, exaggeration, exceeding bounds. From their perspective, Jesus was a great prophet. But you've gone beyond what he claimed. You've gone beyond what he taught. You've gone into excess. You've been led astray. And in fact, what's scary is to remember something, folks. Every single day, a believing Muslim prays five times a day, and in each one of those prayers is what's called Surat al-Fatiha, the opening surah of the Quran. And if you ever listen, if you've been, ever been in an Arabic country, you've heard at the very end of Surat al-Fatiha this line, Vala Thalim, and they, they, they extend out the vowel in the term Thalim. What is Thalim? Those who are led astray. The last part of the, of, the, of the text is, lead us not into the path of those who have earned your anger and those who have been led astray. And when they asked Muhammad what that meant in all the Hadith sources, he said, those who have earned God's anger are the Jews, and those who have been led astray are the Christians. So every single day, the Muslim is praying not to be you. Not to be you. That's what that prayer is about. Because we have gone into exaggeration, excess, going over the line. Verily, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a Razul of Allah, a messenger of Allah. And his word, which he committed to Mary, they understand that to mean that God simply said, be, and he was. They have a, whole, a lot of problem with the Holy Ghost being involved in the conception of, of Jesus. They do believe in the virgin birth, which he committed to Mary and a spirit from him. So believe God and his messengers and say not three. Now stop. Every single time that the Quran says, say not thaleth, three, the very next phrase is always going to say the very same thing. What does it say? Refrain, it is better for you. God is only one God. Every time it says don't say three, the next assertion is there is only one God. Now, if I said to you, let's say you live in Chicago, and Chicago has two major league baseball teams, 
right? Uh, you got the White Sox, and you got the other guys that can never win the World Series. So if I was talking to somebody about baseball, and I said, do not say to, there is only one baseball team in Chicago. Isn't it obvious that when I said, do not say two, I was talking about two baseball teams? So if the Quran says, say not three, there is only one God, then what is the author of the Quran thinking you and I are saying when we say three? Three gods. It's obvious. It's plain as the nose on your face. And I've had many a Muslim. I was debating Yusuf Ismail in the Juma Masjid in Durban, South Africa. It used to be the largest uh, mosque in the southern hemisphere, placed for 3,200 prayer mats in that mosque. And he specifically said right there, he said, James, I know you claim to be a monotheist, but you're really a polytheist. And what's his authority for that? The Quran and the un misunderstanding of the author of the Quran. So we are told, say not three. This is what the young lady was saying in the mosque. Refrain, it is better for you, for God is only one God. Glory be to him that he should have a child. Hmm, I've heard that somewhere before. What does the author of the Quran understand as far as the sonship? What does sonship mean in the mind of the author of the Quran? Is it what we mean? Is it, is it an eternal relationship term? Or is it something that involves the, the need for a consort, a wife, and birth? That's the question. In Surah Al-Maida, Surah 5, Surah 517, they indeed have disbelieved who say God is the Messiah, son of Mary. That's considered to be kafir, disbelief. Say, who would have any power over God if he desired to destroy the Messiah, son of Mary, and his mother, and those on earth altogether? Unto God belongs sovereignty of the heavens and the earth, and whatsoever is between them. He creates whatsoever he will, and God is powerful over all things. Because God could destroy Jesus and Mary, then they can't be God. Now catch that about Mary. Make a little mental note. What is the author of the Quran thinking we think about Mary? The point that they could be destroyed means they can't possibly be God. Same surah, surah 5, next verse. And the Jews and the Christians say, we are the children of God and his beloved ones. Say, why then does he punish you for your sins? Nay, but you are mortals of his creating. So how is the author understanding even our claim to be the sons of God? Taking it in a literal sense. Not understanding the concept of adoption through Christ, anything like that. Remember, you're talking about someone who never read a word of Paul. And evidently didn't talk to anybody else who had very deeply either. Same surah, surah 572. They certainly disbelieve those who say, truly God is the Messiah, the son of Mary. But the Messiah said, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Now, if you, if you want to try to find out where Jesus, Jesus said these things, don't bother looking in the concordance of your Bible. The Quran will quote Jesus a number of times. It it's always strikes me, I have to make mention of the fact, that my Muslim friends will, will borrow Bart Ehrman to cast doubt on the Gospel of Mark, which is clearly written in the first century. And then they will accept this absolute gospel truth, everything Jesus allegedly said in the Quran, that comes 600 years after Jesus and does not have a modicum of historical connection to historical Jesus at all. They use different standards. It's a, it's a, it's a different scales situation. Surely whosoever ascribes partners unto God, there's shirk again, God has forbidden him the garden and his refuge shall be the fire and the wrongdoers shall have no helpers. They certainly disbelieve those who say, truly God is the third of three. Well, there's three again, and what's the next line? While there is no God save the one God. There's your three again. And now they're saying, we're saying God is the third of three? Who is this three? You never have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Quran. Not once, especially because the Holy Spirit's the angel Jabril. Never is Father, Son, and Spirit found in the Quran together. There's only one place where three persons are brought together in this context, and we'll be closing up with that when we get to it. I'm hurrying as quickly as I can. If they refrain not from what they say, a painful punishment will befall those among them who disbelieved. Will they not turn to God in repentance and seek his forgiveness, and God is forgiving and merciful? Folks, to believe what we believe is considered to be a sinful act by the author of the Quran. It is rebellion. It is, seems very clearly to be shirk. 
Will they not turn to God in repentance and seek his forgiveness? And God is for forgiving and merciful. The Messiah, son of Mary, was not but a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him. And his mother was truthful. Both of them ate food. Ding, 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 ding. You getting the, getting the, getting the message? And guess who's included in this? Mary. Behold how we make the signs clear unto them, yet behold how they are perverted. It's perverted to believe whatever it is the author of the Quran thinks it is that we believe. Say, do you worship apart from God that which has no power to benefit or harm you when it is God who is the hearing, the knowing? Say, O oh, people of the book, do not exaggerate, there it is again, in your religion beyond the truth, and follow not the caprices of the people who went astray, who are them? Christians. And led many astray and strayed from the right way. This is the clear teaching of Surah 5. Now we get toward the end of Surah 5. Then God will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, remember my blessing upon thee and upon thy mother when I strengthen thee with the Holy Spirit, that thou mightest speak to people in the cradle and in maturity. And when I taught thee the book, wisdom, the Torah, and the gospel, and how thou wouldst create out of clay the shape of a bird by my leave, and thou wouldst breathe into it, and it would become a bird by my leave, and thou wouldst heal the blind and the leper by my leave, and thou wouldst bring forth the dead by my leave, and how I restrained the children of Israel from thee when thou didst bring them clear proofs, and those who disbelieved among them said, this is not but manifest sorcery. I don't have a lot of time here. I know I'm rushing, but did you catch any of that? Spoke from my cradle. That's the Arabic infancy gospel written 500 years after Christ. The author of the Quran doesn't realize that that's a later source. All he knows is it says something about Jesus. Must be in the gospel. And what about creating birds? Anybody know where that comes from? Infancy gospel of Thomas. Yeah, we're talking uh, third century. So the author of the Quran has no idea what the canon of the New Testament is, what is in it and what is not. And he's drawing from all these different and contradictory sources and ascribing all of this to Jesus. And so finally, we get to Surah 5, 116. And when God said, O Jesus, son of Mary, didst thou say unto mankind, take me and my mother as gods apart from God? He said, glory be to thee. It is not for me to utter that to which I have no right. Had I said it, thou wouldst surely have known it. Thou knowest what is in myself, and I know not what is in thyself. Truly, it is thou who knowest best the things unseen. Here, folks, is the only place in the Quran where you have three. It's the only place. Only place. Do you see it? Didst thou say to mankind, take me and my mother as gods apart from Allah? There's your trinity. Allah, Mary, and their baby boy Jesus. And we can understand where this came from. If you're a 15-year-old from Mecca, and you go on caravan up into Syria, you're going to go exploring, and you're going to go looking, and you look into a Christian church in, say, 580, 590, what are you going to find? Well, you're going to find lots of statuary, you're going to find art, you're going to have depictions of God, you're certainly going to see the crucifix all over the place. You might see a, you might see a dove, but that's not going to say anything to you, that's not going to communicate anything to you without a background. And you're going to see a lot of what? A woman. And what's the woman going to be holding? A little baby. So you've got a law. You've got a woman. You've got a little boy who ends up on a cross. Oh, so that's what Christians believe the Trinity is. There, there is a way to rescue the Quran here, but I've not found any Muslims want to go here. This could be a prophetic refutation of Mormonism. Seriously. I mean, because in Mormonism, Elohim in a physical body has relations with Mary to create the body of Jesus. So I've said to, I've said to some Muslims, you, you know, if you want, you could say this is a prophetic refutation of Joseph Smith. And they all sort of look at me like, what? <laughs> Otherwise, this is not what Christians believed even in the days of Muhammad. And I've said to many a Muslim, look, by 632 and Muhammad died, there was no question what the doctrine of the Trinity was. All the Christological controversies were of the past. And even if the Trinity is false, did Allah know what it was in 632? Well, of course he did. Could he have refuted it even if Muhammad didn't understand it? Of course he could have. And yet there's nothing 
in the Quran that even comes close to a meaningful argument against what the biblical doctrine of the Trinity actually is. There's your three. There's your three. Now, I think I have one more clip. I'm hurrying as quick as possible. I think the next should be, I don't have it in front of me here, uh, a gentleman I'm, I'm hoping to debate in Hong Kong in October. Wa'el Ibrahim was asked about, well, here, Isaiah 9, 6. We all know the text, where a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, that they will be called Wonderful, Counselor, and Mighty God. And I translate Aviad as Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. The reason being that many people stumble over that phrase, Everlasting Father. Well, I, I thought you told me he's not the Father, he's the Son. Well, those are New Testament revelations of their relationships to one another. Father of God in the Old Testament is primarily of God as Creator. And I just want to mention in passing, I took a lot of time yesterday to do this. That is actually the Isaiah Dead Sea Scroll. And if you read Hebrew, Aviad is right across from the Aviad over there. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and I'm sure all of you caught that. You're, oh, we saw that. We, no, we were, yeah. In fact, it, it, it took you longer to read the English than it did for us, the Hebrew, actually. So, you know. Let me give you an illustration of exactly how this works. Here is when Wa'il Ibrahim was asked last October in a debate on the Trinity in Hong Kong about Isaiah 9-6. Let's hope the connection works here. I would again say that you guys are adding troubles to more, uh, more to your troubles, to your existing pro problems. Again, let us read the verse. Can you please, Brother Lee, help me read the verse again? Okay. Unto us. It says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will, will be on his shoulders. He will be called once Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All right. Where does the name of Jesus mention? Because the question started like this. Jesus is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. Now, I asked that purposely. I asked Lee purposely to read it again so that we can focus a bit and see where does Jesus mention in the Old Testament. Not only that, the verse states that this son will be called. I want you to focus on the words. I'm very particular when it comes to terminologies. I'm using your own words which are found in the Bible. It says what? He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I will repeat again. Jesus will be called Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father. Jesus will be called Everlasting Father. But earlier in the Trinity's definition, we say what? The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. Now He is called Everlasting Father. So this is the problem. The problem is, show me one ayah, one verse in the Bible, in the entire New Testament, where Jesus is really called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Show me these definition for sh show me these quotations from your new testament that jesus was called with these four names i'm ready to get baptized now i've called him on that we took the time to go through all of them illustrate the new testament fulfillments and, and where would you go for aviad father of eternity i go to colossians chapter one for by him are all things whether, whether in heaven and earth visible invisible principalities powers dominions or authorities all things created by him and for him he is before all things and in him all things soon as can they hold together that is the fulfillment of aviad in the new testament and, uh, but I don't want him to get baptized just because we can provide that fulfillment. He really needs to actually believe before he does anything like that. He's actually a really nice guy. I pray that, that we are able to, to set up some, some debates there in Hong Kong with him. Why does all of this matter? Well, I will close with this, why it matters. In John chapter 8, Jesus stood before the Jews. You remember what happens in that chapter? By the end of the chapter, when, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, they pick up stones to stone him. Remember earlier in the chapter they had heard Jesus arguing and many had believed in him, but it was a surface level belief. It was not an ongoing belief. It was a false faith. And so by the end of the chapter they have rebelled against him. He's talked about their, their sinfulness and their slavery to sin. But in John 8, 24, when speaking to people who were right there in front of him, he said these words, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. The Greek phrase is ego imi, and yes, actually, if you're, those of you who are far ahead of me, you're reading Codex Sinaiticus over in the sidebar, and yep, that's John 8, it's right there at the bottom of the page. It's been there from the beginning. 
If you are aware of what that phrase means, it goes back to the Hebrew, anahu. And that is used as the name of God over and over again. In Isaiah 43.10 and, and numerous places in the prophets, you will find this terminology used. That's why at the end of John 8.58, when he says, I am, they pick up stones to stone him. The Jews in front of him would have accepted him as a miracle worker. They would have accepted him as a Messiah, as a prophet. But that wasn't enough. And the Muslims say to us, we accept Jesus as the Messiah, though they have no idea what the Messiah was supposed to do. We accept him as a great prophet. He was sent to the people of Israel, but to them only. And that is not enough. The Muslims will tell you we're a part of the second largest religion in the world that teaches people to love Jesus. But they've got the wrong Jesus. And Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, those are serious words. Those are serious words. And today, my friends, my prayer, my prayer is that by his spirit, we would be caused to be a people that love the Muslim people, do not fear the Muslim people, that reject the movement that is taking place, even amongst many evangelicals today, to demonize every Muslim, to cause you to be afraid of them, and hence not to seek to witness to them, to give your life in service to them, but instead that we would be the people who would know our faith well enough, be able to go to the Word of God, give them the information that they need to hear so that the Spirit of God can bring his elect people unto himself because he has his people amongst the Muslim people. What he needs are people who love him and his gospel enough to love them to go and to speak and to be used to bring that message to them. My prayer is you will be those people. Thank you for your attention.